Thank you, Carolyn. Brian asked us to move up here because, as Carolyn said, we are. Uh, you, he said it's because of the lighting, but I got to tell you, I, I think it's because I move too much for the camera, and they want to try to tie me down a little bit, and so he figures I'll just go to the edge here, uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, but we'll see if I step. We'll see if I step off or not. But I thank you for bearing with us during these changes. We're always amazed at how many people pick us up on the internet feed and how many people have been downloading the, uh, uh, the video. We do have an app now for both Android and, uh, and iPhone users, and you can, you can get the video of, uh, of the lessons uh, and the audio, either, either one, on the app. And so uh, we've had a great number of act activity on that also. Uh, in the hallowed halls, of my alma mater, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, it is said that 1 Corinthians 7 is where preachers go to die. <laughs> A good deal of it is about marriage. I don't know that I'm in any form an, an expert, but we are creeping up on 40 years. So, uh, I think, think the key is, guys, just to find a woman that will put up with you for 40 years. But I, as I was preparing for the lesson for several weeks now, I did come across an article that I found was fascinating. And that a new study has shown that the divorce rate was much higher, 50% higher, among couples who shared household chores. I want you to think about that. So... So, I think that doing the dishes ought to be out of the question, and I'm just thinking about, this, about our marriage, sweetie. <laughs> you can't get involved in this particular scripture without taking a close look at our current societal attitudes about marriage. And I, for one, have been highly distressed about the institution of marriage, the, the attack on marriage that seems to be going on. And uh, I did read a, kind of a bad news, good news thing that recently, the, in the last few years, the divorce rate has actually fallen. And the, you, you, know, you think, well, the, you know, maybe we're finally getting this figured out and people are settling in a little more. But actually, the reason for that is that fewer couples are marrying and, and more are cohabitating. So they're not getting married. They're just shacking up. And so what happens is the, the breakup rate is just as, high, as higher for them, actually, than it is for committed couples. And so, you know, the, the, mar the uh, marriage rate, the divorce rate, actually, has not declined, you know, significantly at all. And, w and while we're at it, let me just get something off my chest here. I, I don't like the way that uh, contemporary culture has co-opted words and phrases from us. You know, perfectly good words and phrases that mean something completely different. And a word that really gets me these days is fiancé. Fiancé means you have a ring and a date. To me, that means fiancé. It's not your shack up honey. And that, that seems to be the word these days. This is my fiancé. Well, do you have a ring? No. Do you have a date? No. Well, I just, that means we're cohabitating. We're living together. Uh, and so that's another thing that's really worked to tear at the fabric of marriage. Uh, one that I don't have to say too much about here is the issue of gay marriage. That uh, the, We're rapidly approaching the point where the majority of Americans think that's just fine. So if I look at the, the assault on what God calls marriage, uh, it's the point where now, as vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, Chick-fil-A, you just say we're in support of the biblical model of marriage. You get torn apart in the public arena. Uh, so I think we need to take a good close look at marriage. This is not uh, Paul's definitive work on marriage because I don't think marriage is the point here. Actually, the point is the end times. But uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So let's turn in, uh, to the place where pastors die, uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want to give you a background before we read the, the, the first verse there to, because it's going to really give you a, a leg up. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is going to illuminate your scripture uh, if, you, if you read it without any background information. But God never intended us for do this, to do this out of ignorance. So I want to remind you about the situation about which Paul wrote. The church at Corinth 
was located in perhaps the most wicked city of its time, one of the most wicked cities of all time, uh, all civilization. And he's writing to the church there that uh, has got some problems. It's got a significant number of problems, and this is quite likely the second of, of four uh, missives that have gone back and forth, along with several messages that have been brought from couriers. Uh, and I want you to know that he's talking... Uh, uh, from a perspective that's uniquely Pauline, when you look through Scripture, you'll find that, and I've said this before, I truly believe that Paul believed that Jesus was coming back any day, certainly within his lifetime. And that colored everything he did. It co certainly colored everything that the church did. As the pastor said two weeks ago, can you imagine trying to explain to the Apostle Paul uh, a casual church member? Someone who just comes on Sunday morning and that's about all the church they see during the week. That concept would not have registered with the apostle. There was a sense of urgency that just that, that crawls out of everything he writes and certainly everything he said. I want you to remember that because that's very important to what he's saying today. One of the difficulties we run into, you also need to know, uh, is that unless we're reading this in the original Koine Greek, you're getting a translation which means you're getting an interpretation, which means you're getting a commentary. Uh, and this never, never came out any clearer, I think, than when Von Smith called me this week. And I was glad to see somebody was actually reading the lesson. He says, have you read this in the King James? And I said, oh, you bet. I've read it in about five different, different translations. And it's striking as to the differences in translation in the first verse particularly. We'll clear that up in just a moment. He begins with, now for the matters you wrote about. So that tells me he's got a list of questions that the church has sent to him. And let me tell you, they didn't have rules. And I, I mean, certain Christian scholars have said Paul made it up as he went along. Nonsense. But I'll tell you what, the church didn't have a constitution. They didn't, believe it or not, they didn't have bylaws. You know, they didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They didn't have the Pauline, most of the Pauline letters at that time. And so they had a number of questions. They had the gospel, but any time you preach the gospel, there's going to be someone uh, with their own spin on it, and they wanted a clarification. So they had written him with a number of questions, and you're going to start seeing them pretty plainly as we read on through chapter 7. Uh, here's one of the difficulties. He says, Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. Now, there are a number of problems with what I just read there. I want to try to get them all cleared right now. The first is that uh, somebody else has got a different translation. Larry, I know you probably do. What does it say in, in verse 1 there with you in the King James? It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Does anybody else have a, another translation? Yes. It is good for a man not to have relations with a woman. That's pretty much the same translation as the new NIV. Uh, I'm, I'm reading from the 1984 NIV. So you start to see a different. In, so what we've got is we've got it's, it's taken from some of the same text, but the people who translated it are looking at it completely different. The King James Version uh, was taken from the Textus Receptus. Uh, it's, it's not the original. It wasn't the autograph. But the best Greek that we have of the time literally translated says this. Look, here's what you wrote me about. And then it's a quote. I want to, I want to explain that. He's not saying it's good for a man not to marry. He's saying this is what you wrote me. You wrote me and said, okay, it's good for a man not to marry. And he's going to com comment on that. The literal translation is this. It is, it is good not to touch a woman. Now, in the vernacular of the day, it, that's idiomatic, and that, that's referring to sexual relations is what it's referring to. Uh, it, when Paul's speaking, it wouldn't have occurred to him that, that perhaps that's taken place out of wedlock, so, so that's why the translators of the NIV said, look, it's best for you not to marry. Here's the question, though. Someone was saying in the church, uh, and this is, I thought was very ironic because, remember, there was a great deal of sexual license taken in this church. They had all kinds of immorality going on in this church. Remember the one we talked about a few weeks ago where uh, the church was even proud about the fact that one man was having a sexual relationship with his, with his uh, stepmother. So there was apparently another group inside the church, though, that was saying, okay, no sexual relations at all. So he's answering that question right now. They said, okay, what about this group that says, well, there shouldn't be any of this going on at all? So he says, okay, let me discuss that. 
Since there's so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. That's talking about the sexual relationship within marriage. So someone had said, well, it's just best that there's you know, no sexual activity going on at all. He said, no, that's not true. Since there's so much immorality, and particularly in the city of Corinth, he's saying, look, there are temptations on every side. I, listen, they didn't have internet porn then, but what they had was just as bad with the temple with 1,000 prostitutes there. So there, there was temptation, there was immorality going on. And he said, look, there's so much immorality, it's best that you continue to have a sexual relationship within the marriage, and it never occurred to him that, that would, there would be anything else. But a relationship between a man and a woman. Each husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. And there's been more mischief and bad behavior done uh, under the name of that scripture by men over history who, who, you know, waggle the Bible over wives. But you know what? It also says something else. The husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. So he's talking about a good, biblical, balanced, physical relationship between a husband and wife. Now look what he says. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. It would have been quite common in that time that when they had a time of prayer that involved fasting and prayer, it would also have, have included abstinence at the same time. And so to this group who says, well, okay, time's short. We're not having any more physical relations. He said, no, don't necessarily do that. Don't deprive of each other of, of that except by mutual consent by agreement from both, and just for a time. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Did he know us or what? He said, we are wired for a, for a physical response. And he knew that. God blessed that. And I want you to remember that when we go through this chapter, Paul is not in any way talking about the fact that sex between a man and a woman in a committed marital relationship is not a good thing. In no way is he insinuating that. He says, you know what? And besides that, rather than have a lack of self-control, it's better that you do have relations with one another and you keep it within the marriage. But look what he says. I say this as a concession, not as a command. He said, I'm not commanding you to do that, unlike a preacher that Dan mentioned today who gave that command to his congregation, as a matter of fact. I don't know if you read about that, but uh, I'll explain it to you later. Um, I wish that all men were as I am. Well, what does that mean? What is I am? I'd like for you to do a little Bible uh, reading uh, and a little Bible history. And it's kind of interesting when you looked at the uh, the Jewish community of the day of which Paul was an integral part be before his conversion. Uh, rabbis of the day uh, said that a man would be better off knocked in the head with a rock than to remain single. That's one of the leading rabbis of the day. Uh, if Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin, we don't know for sure that he was, but it was very likely that he was from some of the comments that he made. He would have had to have been married. So history tells us that it's more than likely that Paul was married at one time or another. Obviously didn't have a wife when all this was going on, so you've got a couple of options. Either he was widowed, or she perhaps left him at his conversion. We don't know exactly what went on there. Uh, and once again, I'm taking a little license there. I can back it up historically, partially with Scripture, but, and if you want to believe Paul was never married, that's okay. We shall not break fellowship over that. But history seems to indicate that it's quite likely that he was. But he's not now. And he says, look, it might be better if you were as I am. But each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. So he's referring to singleness and accompanying it celibacy as being a gift. So he says, look, not everybody can do this. But I just prefer that you were all as I. Now, you would, first reaction might be, well, Why? To what is he referring? We'll get to that in just a moment. Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So the question had undoubtedly come, well, you know what? I'm widowed. Can I remarry? Jesus is coming again soon. Do I need to get involved in this relationship now? Or someone could have said, look, I'm single. We've got a, a wedding planned. 
What do we do now? And this is advice. You know what? It really might be better if you remain single. But look, if that's going to be an issue with celibacy, don't do it. I'd rather you be married. Because... He knows the human condition, and he knows that if, if we started looking at celibacy as one of the superior gifts, then people would remain single, and then when their passions ignited, might be having relationships on the side. He says, that's not good, because the point is not just to be unmarried. The point is to be unmarried for a reason. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. I want you to look at that because there are three different times in this chapter that he's going to tell you that this didn't come from the Lord, it came from me. Or, in this case, he's going to say, I didn't make this up. This came directly from the Lord, and he's talking about Christ. A wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. Now, some are saying that contradicted the teachings of Jesus, uh, and I'm amazed at how Christians always want to comb through the Scriptures and find reasons for divorce, when the fact is that Jesus told us plainly, you know what, the only reason God ever allowed for divorce is because He knew your hearts were hard. That never was intended to be His model. One of the difficulties of that is, is that it is not the unpardonable sin. Those of you who have been lifelong Baptists are going to have a hard time believing that because according to the Baptists, that's the unpardonable sin. It's not. It is a sin. And he says that right here. He said, look, you should not leave your husband. And he says, husband, you should not divorce your wife. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. Now, I actually heard a preacher one time say, well, then that means that this is really not scriptural. What? No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit inspired this just as much as he inspired Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what he's saying is that, listen, Jesus didn't say anything specific about this, and so I'm going to fill the gap. The Lord has revealed this to me. To the rest I say, if a brother has a wife who is not a believer, and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. So the question had come up, okay, I've come to know Jesus. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Uh, I want to serve him as best I can. But you know what? I've got this wife from, from the Greek culture, and she's not going to not going to convert right now, so should I just walk away and leave her? Here's the answer, no. You must not. And if a woman has a husband who's not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. I'm thankful for that because Karen would have left me. Really. I was not a believer when we married. So we've got the same situation. A woman says, well, my husband is not a believer. Should I leave him? Believe it or not, I get that question not quite often, but on occasion, uh, from a, a faithful woman who's here in church who hus whose husband is not saved, doesn't look like he's going to be saved to her, and, and they, she said, well, do I really need to divorce him because we're not to be un unequally yoked? And, and here's the answer right here, no. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. That doesn't mean what you might think it means. Don't get in your, in your mind that uh, just because Karen was saved, that somehow I was saved because she was saved, or that your husband is going to be saved, or that he's going to go to heaven because he's married to you. Uh, that's a Mormon teaching, by the way, uh, for, for husbands. Uh, that's not the kind of thing that we believe. Sanctified means what? Okay, set apart. Sanctified means set apart. So, I don't understand the full implication of this, but apparently there is a, a protection, a hedge around the husband or wife of a believer as there are with their children, as we're going to find out in, in just a moment. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her, through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they're holy. He's saying this to a great deal because he's got a mixture of two cultures here. He's got the Greek culture and he's got the, the, the Jewish culture. Remember, Timothy was a product of that culture. And so the idea was that Timothy was, in fact, sanctified because his mother was Jewish. So that question could well have come up. And he said, look, your children are still sanctified because one of you is a believer. Do they still need to make their own decision regarding relationship with Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are people who have taken this and the three places in Scripture where it says one person came to know the Lord and their household with him and used this to teach that an, an imparting of, of, of 
of sanct- not, just, not just sanctification, but of uh, conversion on a whole household based on the, on the belief of one person. That's not what the Scripture teaches on the, on the bulk of the teaching. If an unbeliever leaves, let him do so. So this is saying, man or woman, if your unbelieving spouse leaves, uh, it might be best to let them do so. And that that person, the believer, is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. That seems like an odd segue to what he just said. But in this case, he's saying, look, you are not going to be judged as to whether you save your spouse. Are you expected to share with them and do your best to lead them to Christ? Absolutely you are. But if it's going to cause, cause real disharmony in the family, it might be best if that person left. Uh, I see it distressingly often that we will go and visit one spouse and the other person is so hostile that they won't let us, like generally it's a wife, will catch us at the doorstep and say, oh, I'm glad you're here, but please don't come in. You know, he, he could get violent. He could get very angry about it. And that's the kind of instance that Paul is talking about here. That if, the, that if this person leaves, he said, you're not, you're not to divorce them, but if they leave, let them go. You're no longer bound. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So he said, look, you know, you could live with them for 30, 40, 50 years, and they never come to know the Lord. Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life to which the Lord assigned him and to which the Lord has called him. Now he's shifting gears here because apparently someone has asked another question. Uh, It could have gone like this. Uh, I am a slave. I have come to know the Lord Uh, Should I expect that I should now be made free? Uh, We think of Philemon um, and Onesimus uh, immediately when that comes to mind. Uh, The pastor quoted a well-known pastor uh, a couple of, last week, where they said, you know, Paul had it wrong on slavery. Uh, The social justice, uh, social gospel uh, people now think that Paul really had it wrong on, on slavery and that the Bible supported slavery. The Bible does not support slavery. Nowhere does it say that slavery is a good thing, that it's the state of man that ought to exist, but slavery did exist. And Paul had an interesting take on it. He said, you know what? Slavery is a condition just like any other condition uh, in life that's not pretty. It's not the most important thing. What is the most important thing? Your relationship with Christ. So he says, that's where you're a freeman. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But he said, look, if, if you're a slave... You might want to stay like that. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumstances, uh, excuse me, circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. I don't know how you do that trick. <laughs> We're talking ritually here. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. And we know he fought that fight. Uh, with Timothy, he, said, he put his foot down and said, no, that he shouldn't. But with Titus, he recommended that he did. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Listen, he is not denigrating the covenant that God made with his chosen people. What he's saying is, look, in in matter salvific, circumcision is not the point. And there were people who were preaching that it was. Keeping God's command is what counts. Each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although you can gain your although if you can gain your freedom, do so. So he's saying, look, it's fine. If you can become a freeman, there's no problem there. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freedman. And that's what I love. He says, you know, you may still be a slave in man's eyes, but the Lord has set you free. Similarly, when he was, he was a freeman when he was called as Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers, each man as responsible to God should remain in the situation God called him to. So... Paul, Paul saw people jockeying for social position and wanting to know what difference Christ in their lives made. And he's saying it shouldn't make any in terms of your social position. The difference that it should be made is in your relationship to him and what are we going to do with it going forward. There was a question apparently about, about virgins or those who were about to be married. Now, about virgins, I have no command for the Lord. In other words, Jesus didn't, didn't speak about it. But I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. 
Because of the present crisis, I think it's good for you to remain as you are. Now, that answers the question. What's the present crisis? Many different opinions about it. Some say it was a, it was a famine as a result of a drought, and it's historically supported uh, in, in, in the Greek uh, in the in the Greek territories of that time that was causing severe economic hardships. And he said, "Look, times are hard now. Perhaps it's best that you don't rem- that you you remain single." I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think he's talking about the persecution, uh, which was really pretty light at this time, but becoming greater, and the persecution to come. I really think that's what he's talking about when he says, okay, because of the difficulties today, I think it's good for you to remain as you are. Are you married? Don't seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Don't look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. Why why would he say that? To contradict people who were saying that. that Apparently they had written written him and said, look, some people are saying that if you marry, it's a sin. He said, no, that's not the case. If you marry, you're not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she's not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. I've heard it way too many men quote that and think it was really funny. But in the context, it's not. He says, you know what? Uh, Being married brings up a whole set of difficulties when it comes to serving the Lord. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as though they had none. And I want you to stop and think about that some, because um, I've talked to Karen about that before when we're, I don't know what, what brought up the discussion, to tell you the truth, but I said, you know what, I've just had this, uh, I know that my job in this world is to take care of her. I mean, that's the way I'm wired. That's, and I don't, don't know if my mom and dad taught me that or, or, or if that's just the way that, that genetically I'm wired. But that's my job, to take care of her. Uh, my first allegiance, my first relationship is with Jesus Christ. And she accepts that, and that doesn't bother her, because I expect that that's the same thing with her. But after that, she's it. She, she's my focus. And Paul knew that um, in times of difficulty, my first concern is going to be about her. And in times of difficulty, he wants our first concern to be what? To be on the kingdom. So he knows that that men are going to have a divided loyalty, that women are going to have a divided loyalty when they are married. That's not bad. That's that's what God set up for us. But he said, given the present crisis, perhaps it's better if we're not distracted. And that's what he means when it says, okay, I want to spare you this. But what I mean, brothers, is that the time is short, all right? Those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they did not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present way is what? Passing away. And if you've, if you've been any part of the pastor series, for the, just finished today, the three-week series, we get the, I don't know, more and more plainly the, the truth that the world in its present form is passing away. I don't know, I just feel like we're at the end of that rewound VHS tip when it's, when it's going faster and faster. I would like you to be free for concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. How can he please the Lord? But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world. How can he please his wife? And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world. How can she please her husband? Now, I want you to know that in the early, in the early days of the church, I'm not going to say the Catholic church because it was, was the Catholic church at that time, uh, there, there came this idea that perhaps it would be best that those who served the Lord were unmarried so that they could focus their time on that. That's why our Catholic brothers and sisters uh, believe that the priests and, and, and nuns, for example, should remain not, un, not, not only unmarried, but here's the rub, celibate. Because if you're unmarried, you really need to be celibate. And so you see the kind of difficulty that's presented over the years? I mean, in our lifetime, certainly, the history that, that that's developed. And so that's why Paul has said, look, I understand that you're wired as a sexual person. And if you can't control that, if you can control that, you've been given a gift. And that's wonderful. It frees you, like me, to, to, to serve the Lord. But if you can't, then what you need to be is married. Now, 
And so their, their interests are divided. Uh, if anyone thinks he's acting improperly toward the virgin he's engaged to, and she's getting along in years, and he feels that he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He's not sinning. In other words, someone had probably written him and said, okay, I'm, I'm engaged. And even in that time for secular society as well as Jewish society, breaking an engagement was tantamount to a divorce. So he was saying, well, should I divorce my betrothed? And Paul says, no, not necessarily. You should go ahead and get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion but has control over his will and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So if you have a man who says, you know what, the end is coming. Uh, I'm not married yet, although I'm betrothed. I don't want to let her down, but you know what? My focus really needs to be on the Lord, and I think he's given me that gift of, of a celibacy, of singleness. Then he said, that's fine. That's what you should really do. So then he who marries the virgin does right, but he do, who does not marry her does even better. So someone had asked that question, and he's telling them, look, I'm not going to tell you whether to marry them or not. But here are the ramifications. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier as she stays as he is. And I think that I, too, have the Spirit of God. So I want you to put in perspective that Paul is firmly convinced that, that, that the end is coming soon. Should we be? Yeah. Because as the pastor said today, I, I, too, find it really kind of interesting when people get all worked up about the end times. What am I going to do? What are we going to do? Well... What difference does it make if you know the end's coming? And if you're behaving differently because the end's coming, well, shame on you. Because we're to behave as if the end's coming any day. I want to share with you, though, some biblical teachings about divorce, just so we don't have any misconceptions here. The divine standard for marriage is a lifelong commitment to one spouse. Nothing else. Even though divorce was permitted in some cases under Old Testament law, Christ made it plain that this was not God's ideal. If you want to look up Matthew 19, 3, that's fine. Uh, also, that a Christian should never marry a non-believer. We're going to find that when we get into 2 Corinthians. There is some evidence that adultery on the part of one party is grounds for divorce, and it frees the wrong party to remarry. Um, I don't know if I believe this or not. I believe Jesus says, if you want the grounds for divorce, there it is. But it's still best that you not do that. After a divorce or separation, it's best for both partners to remain single. In either case, divorce or remarriage is not the unpardonable sin. That's what I want you to get. Um, God is able and willing to forgive all sins, including even the sin of getting a divorce for trivial reasons. He's called us to peace. Uh, not legal bondage. He can make a good marriage and a happy home no matter what the previous history of the people involved may be, provided that true repentance, proper restitution, and genuine saving faith and sincere desire to serve the Lord exist in their lives. We need to be a people of redemption and not, one, not people who are punitive. I want you to think about the primary focus of chapter 7 not being marriage, yes or no, but about the uh, imminent coming of Christ. We have the benefit of 2,000 years of history looking back and saying, well, Christ's return wasn't as quick as they thought it was going to be. But on God's timeline, how fast is it? As quick as finger snap, 1,000 years is. So I want you to think about that. Is Christ coming soon? Yes, he is. Could be before I pray today. Um, it could be another 2,000 years. Could be 2018. I don't know. What difference does it make? I think what Paul said then is just as good today as it was then. Uh, that if you have been given the gift of singleness or the gift of celibacy, that might be a better state. For those of us who weren't, then the ideal state is marriage. Because the sexual part of you uh, needs to find its, its expression, its outlet, in a committed relationship with a spouse. But what we always ought to remember is that our behavior ought to be 
uh, that of someone who believes that Christ is coming now. And what does that entail? Well, there ought to be an urgency about sharing Christ with other people. We have that to some degree here, and we are developing it at a rapid rate, but it's still not where it ought to be. I mean, that ought to be what drives us. Missions, evangelism. We're not here to be fed. We're not here to see what God can give us. But we're here to bring Christ to a lost and dying world. And that's the message of all of Scripture, particularly in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. For next week, read forward. Uh, It gets a little easier, but not much. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day and for the chance that we have to come and share your word. Even though it seems to be difficult, Father, uh, Paul's message is perfectly understandable. That our first allegiance, our first focus, Father, ought to be on you. And we want that to be the case. As the pastor says, Father, we want to keep the main thing the main thing. I want to thank you for these who come to study your word. I would ask that you cause it to blossom in their lives. Now bless us as we go from this place because we are, as always, people sharing Jesus. We do it in your name. Amen. Please find someone that you don't know and say hello to them.